So uh, SM Ali uh, Islami is a, is a staff research scientist scientist at Google DeepMind working on problems related to artificial intelligence. Prior to that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research Center in Cambridge. Uh, he did his PhD at the School of Informatics at University of Edinburgh, uh, during which he was also a visiting researcher in the Visual Geometry Group at the University of Oxford. Uh, his research is focused on getting computers to learn generative models of images that not only produce good samples, but also good explanations for their observations. So, uh, Ali, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I've seen some of your research before at the Alan Turing Institute, and uh, it's, a, it's a real treat to have your presentation here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that invitation, uh, introduction, and for the invitation. Um, this is a, a really exciting um, topic, and um, uh, it's really timely to be talking about it now as well. And um, I couldn't have asked for a better preceding talk than Patrick's. Um, he set up some of the concepts um, very nicely. Um, so I. Uh, my name is Ali. I, I work at DeepMind. I've been at DeepMind for about five years, and. Um, at DeepMind, we study artificial intelligence. Um, I personally study artificial intelligence because I want to understand how human brains work and how um, animal brains work. Uh, but as we've seen in the previous talk, and of course, uh, throughout the conference, AI has uh, lots of practical applications too, uh, not just for design, but all sorts of other things. Um, now, I will, through this talk, connect my research to creativity. Um, uh, and uh, the design process. Um, and uh, I will kind of uh, leave you with a question at the end of the talk, which is whether what I have showed to you counts as genuine creativity or not. Um, I, I won't try to answer that myself, but perhaps it could be uh, a seed for conversation later today. Uh, now to begin, I want to talk a little bit about what I've spent my research career on. So. It's been mostly on machine learning and specifically about understanding and generation of sensory data. So that is, for instance, uh, if we build a computer that takes images as input, can that computer understand the contents of those images? Um, and vice versa, um, if we have a concept or an idea that we want to generate, uh, can a computer turn that concept into some visual or other sensory form? Um, and of course, that, that is the kind of theoretical underpinnings, but the applications uh, are very varied. So you've got applications in robotics, in healthcare, in architecture, in design, and all, all sorts of other places. Um, now, to, to kind of give an intuition for why uh, understanding and generation are linked to each other, and why both are necessary for intelligence, I want to um, uh, begin with an allegory that a famous philosopher made some 2,500 years ago, and that philosopher would be Plato. Um, Plato said that the condition that we humans um, find ourselves in is similar to that of a bound prisoner at the bottom of a cave, for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, so Plato said that we're like this prisoner, and um, Behind this is uh, a collection of objects that he uh, uh, analogized to reality. And what Plato said was that behind that reality was a source of light, this fire, that cast light onto those objects, which uh, uh, resulting, uh, with, which created um, a resulting shadow um, in front of the wall that was in front of the bound prisoners. So the, the point that Plato is trying to make here is that the prisoner has to understand reality only through the observation of the shadow that the prisoner finds in, in front of themselves. And the prisoner doesn't have direct access to that reality. And what Plato is trying to say here is that the reason why um, uh, much of what we find in life is difficult is because we don't have access to reality directly and we only ever see these impoverished uh, representations or shadows of those realities. So 
um, if I were to redraw this image, I would say that there's really two realms that we have direct access to. On the left, we have the realm of images or artifacts. Uh, so these could be photographs, they could be buildings, they could be what we sense through our hands, um, uh, what we sense with our ears. And on the right, we have the realm of representations and concepts. Uh, so this is what we form in our head when we observe those things, when we touch those things, when we hear those things. And we don't actually have access to reality. Like we don't sense the world in proper 3D. We only see it through our eyes. We don't sense the exact meaning of what someone's trying to convey. We hear those words in our ears. And in this context, there are only two kinds of processes you can reason about. One is the red arrow, which goes from the realm of images to the realm of representations. And uh, some people call that representation formation. Some people call that understanding. And then there's the opposite arrow that goes from the realm of representations back to the realm of images. Some people call that generation or creation. Now in Patrick's talk, he had this really nice slide where you had uh, the different chess boards uh, with all their different um, uh, kind of forms, all essentially representing the same kind of concept. So the red arrow would be to see those uh, artifacts and to understand that you're looking at a chessboard. And the process of generation would be to think of the, the concept of a chessboard and to create one of those um, pieces from scratch. Now, um, most of my research is uh, about doing these two acts, i.e. generation and uh, understanding with neural networks uh, and specifically in the context of images. Um, and I realize this is actually very related to some of um, uh, Professor Jeffrey's research as well. So for instance, I look at how human brains or artificial brains might um, uh, aggregate information from lots of 2D views to form a neural representation and then use this neural representation to imagine what a particular scene would look like from different viewpoints. But what I'm going to talk about today is a specific project that uh, looks at this representation generation duality in a much more um, uh, tangible form um, where the generation is actually uh, in, in the physical world, not in a simulated world. And so to motivate that, I'm going to say, well, look at this image. Um, some artist has literally used brush strokes to produce this image. And they've managed to do that so masterfully that in our mind's eye, um, a, a three-dimensional human shape or a human form is being formed, right? So what is it that that artist has done that creates that image, that three-dimensional image in our head? And how is it that this other artist um, uh, using a very different style, uh, using very different brush strokes, manages to convey the exact same thing in our heads? So how does that work? What is the process that powers this? Or say this image, you know, this is getting to be quite far from what, an, what a human actually looks like, but still we can identify these as humans. Or even this image um, by uh, three-year-old Teresa that I found online. So this is very far from what a human looks like, but yet we look at it and we understand that it's depicting a human. It turns out that this process of generating images or artifacts to convey concepts is actually uh, super old. Uh, humans have been doing it for at least 60,000 years. And what's fascinating is that we've been doing it um, since before we had any form of written or communicated language. So, um, it's interesting to think um, that this might actually be somewhat necessary for the kinds of intelligence that we have, the fact that we can form these abstract concepts and plan with them or communicate them to each other. So uh, with this in mind, uh, two or three years ago, a couple of colleagues of mine and I, uh, we started uh, a research project to see if we could build computers that could um, develop um, conceptual representations like this by themselves. And we use a framework uh, that is depicted on this picture here. So we start off by uh, creating uh, a computer program uh, that uh, you might think of as the artist or the creator or in machine learning parlance would be called the policy. 
Um, there's another um, program which you can think of as the canvas or in machine learning lingo, you would call that the environment. And there's a third, which you can think of as the critic uh, and in ML lingo that would be called the discriminator. So these three computer programs work together to build a system that can um, do the things that we want. So how this works is that the creator program, every time it's executed, sends a sequence of actions to the canvas. Each action is like a brush stroke saying, I want to place uh, a stroke of uh, paint with this color and this intensity in this part of the image. Uh, the canvas obviously kind of um, receives those actions and creates an image, you know, as a result of those actions. The resulting image is sent to the critic um, and the critic's job is to effectively assign a score to this image to say, how good did, does this image look? How real does this image look? That score in turn is communicated to the creator. So the critic assigns a score, is communicated to the, critic, uh, to the creator in the form of a reward. And then this process is repeated uh, millions or billions of times until the creator learns through reinforcement learning to send actions to the canvas that create images that satisfy the critic. Uh, so some of you who may have um, practiced uh, in architecture or other design disciplines might be familiar with this uh, uh, setup. And it, in, in reality, it is actually inspired by how um, computer scientists think the design world works. So if you do this loop well enough and for long enough, you can end up with uh, really interesting systems. Um, before I show you some of these results, I want to um, just dive in a little bit deeper into what the resulting networks look like. So as I said, these computer programs are implemented by neural networks. And at the end of this training process, you end up with two neural networks. One is the policy network, which powers the creator. And then there's the discriminator network that powers the critic. So the policy network uh, takes an uncompleted image as input, processes it through multiple layers, and produces the parameters of an action as output. So these are the parameters that specify a particular brush stroke on the canvas. For instance, it's like the pressure involved, the color, and the position of the and the, the, the beginning and the end of the stroke. The discriminator network, as I said before, is one that takes a completed image as input, process it, processes it through multiple layers, and outputs a binary classification, which is whether this image looks real or fake. And uh, just to be super clear about the parameterization, uh, it's very simple. As I said, it's a single brush stroke um, uh, which also has associated color, uh, pressure, size, and beginning and end points. And so the canvas is constructed through a sequence. So the first thing that we did was we uh, trained an, a network to uh, take in images of uh, handwritten characters, black and white, and to reinterpret them through actions that would reconstruct those images. So for instance, this uh, image on the left, uh, the computer turns that into a, a representation that it can execute either in Photoshop or on a simulated arm, uh, or even because it's an interpretable representation, you can take it and actually execute it on a robot. So what you're seeing here is the computer taking an image as input, forming a conceptual representation of that, and at the same time, using that representation to reconstruct that input. Um, this was all uh, very new to us and quite exciting back in the day. This is roughly 2016, 17. Um, but naturally what we wanted to test was whether we could scale this up. So we decided to uh, train the same um, uh, framework on a data set of human faces, of celebrity faces in particular. So these images are now colored. Uh, they have faces of varying um, appearance. And the computer's job is to try and create images that look like these faces. 
Now, it's important to be clear here that uh, the computer never sees a human painting a face. So it never sees how we humans would reinterpret these images as paintings. Um, also, it's never exposed to paintings of faces. So it never sees any image that isn't a photorealistic photograph, right? So it never sees Picasso's or um, uh, Freud's or any other paintings. Uh, but if you train the system well enough and you let it run, you get results that look like this. So this is a video of the painter uh, producing an image that to its eyes looks like a photoreal image. And you can see it using the brushes uh, over a very, very long sequence, um, using it sometimes to do broad shades or to add fine details or to correct its own mistakes. And after about a thousand interactions with the canvas, it's producing something that kind of looks like, um, like a human face, but also kind of looks like a human painting as well. Which was very cool. So to be clear, the computer has never seen a painting, right? It's only through its trial and error um, interaction with the critic that it learns to produce an image like this. And here's some more examples where I'm just showing snapshot of an episode of a thousand step episode. And you can see how it starts off with a primitive shape that it gradually refines until it produces a good image. And here's yet another example, just to show the, the kinds of variability that you can get uh, from a program like this. So this is um, obviously quite uh, interesting um, but you might wonder to yourself, you know, why go through all this bother when we have, um, you know, we have renderers, um, we have CGI applications, we have game engines that can produce um, images of very high quality, much higher quality than this, uh, through other means. So why go through this bottleneck of a brush when we can just render a realistic looking image? And the answer to that is, um, what we intended to do in the first place, which is to ask what would happen if we now, instead of allowing the system a thousand steps to produce an image, we restrict it so it only has maybe 10 or 20 strokes, 10 or 20 brush strokes to reconstruct the image with. And we were very surprised to find uh, results that look like this. So this is the exact same type of system, uh, but it's been trained to produce what it thinks are realistic looking images with only uh, 18 brush strokes, if I remember correctly. Um, and the resulting image, I think, is really interesting to think about. So it represents a human face with, you know, basically two eyes, a straight line for the nose, um, uh, one line for the lips and the, the contours of the face, and that's it. Um, and this is remarkable. Like the only thing this has ever seen are photorealistic images of faces, and yet it's, re it's uh, learned to conceptualize those faces in this way. You might even wonder why does it start with this kind of uh, red stroke in the third panel? Um, but if you actually track that progress, you see that that red stroke eventually becomes the blush in this person's cheeks, which is a very very efficient. Um, way of using the brush strokes that it has available to it. Now, if you take that program and you allow it to generate many more samples, you end up with quite a lot of visual diversity and arguably, I would say, quite a lot of creativity. So these images are produced by the same type of program uh, trained to reconstruct images using very few uh, brush strokes. So if you look at, for instance, this image down here, uh, I would argue that this looks quite Picasso-esque, you know, the way it's representing the nose, the eyes, uh, or up here again, similarly. This is remarkable. It's, you know, brought it down to two dots for the eyes, two lines for the nose, one line for the mouth. Uh, this is perhaps a bit more abstract where you have a single S shape kind of creating uh, the eyes and the mouth uh, in this beautiful composition and so on. Um, so at this point, it, uh, it kind of makes you wonder what is the relationship between uh, randomness and creativity, right? Um, and I would argue that um, in light of this work, my view is that now 
um, creativity is where you do random things that still achieve the goal that you uh, set out to achieve. So these are random uh, interactions with the canvas that still look like faces. And the critic's role is super important in this regard because the critic is what ensures that those random, random interactions still look like faces. The agent is always trying to satisfy that critic. Um, now, of course, this isn't uh, the only way to use AI uh, in a creative way. And certainly it's not the only way to use AI in the creative process. So um, uh, Patrick, for instance, in the previous talk, um, mentions lots of different ways in which AI could be used as part of the design solution. For instance, uh, tables that move around or windows that open and close or doors that open and close. Um, you can also use AI, obviously, to optimize the process of design. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, filtering through different designs or using AI agents to um, assign quantitative metrics to designs. Um, and uh, here on this slide, I'm listing several artists that explicitly use these techniques in their art. But what I think is perhaps um, thought provoking in the work that I just presented is that here you have an AI that is actually doing the design. So it's not a part of the design, but it is the, the author of that design. Now there's interesting questions around whether this can seriously be considered to be creative or not, which um, I will leave uh, for the discussion, but it's something that could definitely be thought about. Now I just want to end with uh, a reminder that um, there's a ton of progress being made in AI at the moment. And uh, some of those are perhaps uh, uh, more discussed in the headlines uh, and in the news. For instance, AIs doing self-driving cars or AIs um, beating humans at board games like chess and Go and so on. But ultimately, I think all of these endeavors are useful to the extent that they um, shed light on how our brains work, um, how we experience design, how we create design, and how we interpret it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how uh, these advancements uh, kind of materialize themselves in, uh, in all the spaces and all the endeavors that uh, we kind of um, spend our time on. So with that, I'll end. Um, and I'll just say that if you want to check out this specific project, uh, go to this website. There's um, hundreds of samples of um, paintings produced by the agent, and they're all animated and interactive, so you can play around with it. And if you want to stay in touch, I can be found on Twitter with this handle. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the amazing presentation. I find the outcome of the algorithm incredibly intriguing. So there is a, a, a strange sense of that the computer is actually creating something akin to human creativity.